Coming up on Chopper's Politics. I am here to serve the house, (laughs) not to be a dictator to the house. You know that and I know that. Hello, I'm Christopher Hope, The Telegraph's Chief Political Correspondent, and welcome to Chopper's Politics. I hope you've added this podcast to your support bubble as we continue to bring you the inside line from Westminster and all the computers plugging into it from afar. This week, I'm joined by the two L's, Lindsay and Layla. That's Speaker of the House of Commons, Lindsay Hoyle, and Lib Dem leadership hopeful, Layla Moran. We'll be discussing why leaving rural towns without a bank is a huge mistake, mulling over the merits of removing problematic statues, and going head-to-head in a game of lockdown bingo. Who's baked banana bread? Who's more likely to have had a DIY fail during lockdown? Place your bets here. There's rarely been a more challenging time to be Speaker of the House of Commons, maintaining the famously high standards while overseeing a virtual parliament and the new socially distanced voting system, anyone for Mog Conga. So how has Sir Lindsay Hoyle found bringing order to the House during such unprecedented times? Lindsay Hoyle, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Great to be with you. How are you finding it? Oh, I've got to say, I'm very lucky. I've got this privileged position, and it is a privilege. I always say it's a privilege to be a Member of Parliament, and no greater privilege than representing Chorley, my hometown. Absolutely. You know, to, to, to become Speaker, I've got to say, I've been so lucky to have so many special events in my life. I always thought you were going to win, because when I held those hustings for the Speakers last autumn, yeah. you were the only one who wouldn't tell us how you voted in the Brexit referendum. And that was, I think that was because you thought, if I win this, I don't want that to be out there on the, on the public record. I, th- I, think, I, think the, I think it was right, because... Whatever happened, I wanted to remain neutral. And I think, as we know, it was very toxic. I think it was right to keep neutrality on something that certainly split the country. Yeah. And without doubt, it split families. And I think for me to sit in that chair, I thought it was better not to be the issue of me going in that chair. And just while we're on the issue of being in that chair, I've got to ask you these some Burko questions. Are you, are you fed up with being asked about him? To, to, to be quite honest, I've got to say, I've not made comment. And in fairness to the former speaker, he's not made comment on me. I think, like everything, when he took over from Michael Martin, I think, you know what you do, you bring your own style, you bring your own way. It's not about going back. It's about dealing with the moment in time within the house. And that's where I am. So, so if I were to ask you, should he get into Parliament with a peerage? Well, how do you respond to that question? I, I'll be quite honest, I think uh, it's one of those questions for others to decide. I am not on the appointments panel, and I'm sure that they will make the right decision. Do you leave a note in, in the drawer with some advice? I've not found the drawer, if there is. <laughs> 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 what, 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 I, what I would say is, I think I've probably the longest apprenticeship in history. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, and it's not, it's not that John Burke wouldn't offer advice, and it's not that I didn't seek advice, but I think after 10 years, I think I had a real feel for it. You know, I've done Prime (laughs) Minister's questions. I've done all the other great things that happened. But the one thing is that I've always done something, but that was the budget. And that, I always believe, was one of the most difficult days, trying to control the House when it's so piped. You know, the whips have a roll. Oh, let's try and undermine the opposition, or the opposition, let's undermine the government. So, you know, I'd had difficult times in the House when when I was in the chair that day, and they came Mm. to say that, tragically, we had a policeman dying, our village Bobby, Dying on the cobbles of Parliament is something I never, ever want to hear again. So that moment of being in the church, suspending the house in very difficult times, I've been through it. I don't want to go back through it. But what I would say is I think it was a good apprenticeship for when I did take over. I noticed that PMQ's parliamentary question time for the PM slipped to 40 minutes this week. You came in with this manifesto of quick sessions getting through it quickly, but it's a bit longer this week. Are you worried about that? No, that's not quite fair, because don't forget, I have to suspend in between because of COVID. Oh, of course. So perhaps it's we were late it started starting. late, so perhaps I should judge you differently. <laughs> that, that's why. And, and, and I think the questions and the answers from the leader and the prime minister was longer than I would have expected of both of them. And part of that is, if you're going to take your time, I'm not going to make backbenchers pay the price because they weren't efficient in their use of time. But we did start much later, because in the end, I want to be a champion of the backbenchers. 
Yeah. And, 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 and in fairness, we've done really well with PMQs. You know, people understand we've got to get on. And what I do is I do speak to the PPS and say, just remind the Prime Minister and to the leader of the opposition, we need to make progress because we've got others to follow. You, you, you were quite uh, cross last week with Matt Hancock for some chuntering from a sedentary position on the front bench. Why is that? When you watch at the moment, because there's so few people in, when somebody chunners, it is so loud and it's being picked up. Yeah. So the chunner was taking place and I just said, no. But then he turned around to tell me what he thought. Well, that's not for him to do that. <laughs> and, and it was about that. And I thought, no, no, that's my job. And all I wanted to do was just enforce the job. And it is important. And it's nothing against Matt Hancock. I get on with him very well, which I try to do with everybody. And I always say, look, I'm here to do a job. I will do my job. I want you to help me do it. You know, I don't pick on people. I don't try to belittle people. I try to make sure that we keep the good business of the house going forward. And long may that continue. So in terms of making your mark, Lindsay Hoyle, you want to be the champion of backbenchers. But more importantly for Telegraph readers, you have pledged to start wearing a full-bottomed wig. No, I think it's more the Telegraph that pledged that for me. <laughs> I've got readers I'm offering... more so than your good self, as you well know. <laughs> I've got readers offering you a full-bottomed wig, Lindsay Hoyle. Now, wh when will you collect it? Do you know, I know. We've got quite a way before we worry about that for a full state opening of Parliament. In fact, I suspect with the government's majority that we could be got another good four and a half years maybe ahead of us. So I have plenty of time to reflect on it. Who would know what might happen to my head of hair at such time? You know, at the moment, I've still got it. By then, I might be desperate for a week. I certainly keep the options open. And what I would say is I will reflect as we get nearer. Don't forget, I have to face Catherine, my wife. I've got to face my daughter, Emma. So what I would say is I do wear the other Really, you're quite right too. It is about the office and I do support the office. And that's what I always say. I will wear the appropriate dress. But don't forget, nobody has worn this this wig for what, I don't know, probably 30 years, 40 years. Well, the last speaker was Bernard Wetherill, wasn't he? It was it, indeed. It was put away somewhere. I, th I think you may have found it, but... But, but it's, it's a bit moth-eaten by now. <laughs> it, it, it was found. <laughs> In fact, rumour had it. It was found the following day. And, and what I would say is, you're right, it had not been opened. It had not been looked at for over 30 years. And I'm, I'm sure your good self won't want to pop that on your head after that length of time. <laughs> In terms of, your, of, of how you're going to reshape Parliament going forward, John Burko really made it a lot about him by the end and was quite interventionist from the chair. We've seen that retreat quite a lot since he became Speaker. Um, are there any actual changes to the fabric of the place you're looking to push through? What, what, what I would say is that I don't want the game to be about me as the referee. I want the game to be about the teams that are playing the game. And I think if I'm spoken about, that tells me maybe... I'm getting too involved. What I'd like to think is that we, we keep the game going well. We're trying to make sure a fair play is there. And I try to ensure that we are working to the rules that are, are upon us. And that's where I come from. I know when I've been to watch rugby league and I'm talking about the referee, that tells me he didn't have a good game. So when they start talking about me, I think of it in the same way. We had a glimpse possibly of the 21st century in Parliament over the past few weeks with this voting from home, and of, and we still have this hybrid parliament of contributing from home if you can't come in for COVID-19 reasons. Were you a bit sad when Jacob Rees-Mogg brought it all back to normal and brought to an end the, the brief Zoom parliament, as we call it? Well, what, what I would say is, I think we've got some amazing stuff in the House of Commons. We've got fantastic stuff. And we set them a challenge, quite right. They took up that challenge. Not only was that challenge delivered, but it was very successful when we did go to virtual voting and we had hybrid proceedings. I think people felt out of their comfort zone with that. What I've got to do is try and ensure that the staff here are safe, members of parliament are safe, and the one thing it did do was ensure it was safer for members. So I do worry about that. I have a duty of care. And in the end, the government sets the agenda. They're in charge of the order paper, not me. And they decided they wanted to come back with something different. And the only way to try and make that work was to have the, you know, we've got a fantastic supermarket in Charlie called Booths, and we have the Booth supermarket queue where it took quite a while to vote. And when people were having to queue, it was about trying to keep them safe. The consequence of that is it does take a long time, as we know it took about 45 minutes the first time. 
The second time, I think we got it down to about 28 minutes. So what we can say is I would sooner people be safe and take longer than trying to cut corners and put people's health at risk. What we are saying is now we're still looking and I'm always challenging our people to say, look, what else can we do? How can we be more efficient? You know, let's have two kids yep. coming in. And we're hopefully next week we will be on the new system of touch voting. That's quite radical. You know, that you'll actually just put your card on the reader and that cash your vote. And up will pop the name of the member and it will say aye if they voted aye or no. This is a little bit of modernisation that I believe that once we get this up and working, I think the House will stick with it. Why do we want clerks running down the stairs because we suddenly call a vote? Members knocking on the door to try and get out because the clerks aren't there. When we full modernisation, like just touching the screen with your card, what a difference. And after all this, we need to go through what we got right, what worked well, what we might change, and what we might want to keep. And I think that's so important. How long do you think we might have social distancing? I mean, I know it's how long is a piece of string. It's going to go on to at least all of next year, isn't it? I don't think so. I think the government have a view that they will keep reviewing two-metre rule. What I would say is I'm not quite sure it'll be next year, but I do think we've got quite a while to go at the moment. Who knows that when we return in September, the two-metre rule may have gone. It may not. But wh whether it has, if, it, if it's gone, of course, we will review uh, on the advice of Public Health England. But on the other hand, if they say the two-metre rule is still in place, we will keep that two-metre in place. I know it. Um, the, the chamber is not as exciting as I like it, but that's a consequence of making sure that people are safe. Like I say, if Public Health England review it and they say to me it is now safe to go down to a metre, we will reflect that in the layout of the house and in the, in the measurements that we've placed everywhere. You said there that the chamber's not, a, not as exciting. Do you think that helps Keir Starmer or Boris Johnson? I, th I think like everything, you get used to different ways, don't you? And, and I always think you've got two completely different styles of politicians. Yeah, totally. um, and, it's, and it's quite interesting. In fairness, I've only seen Keir Starmer in the way that we're seeing him at the moment which is in a reduced chamber. And naturally, I've seen Boris do both. And um, what I would say is Boris is a people person. He's, you know, he's flamboyant. And he gets the crowd behind him. He's a showman. Yeah. You know, he is a showman. And, and that's the difference, isn't it? You know, Keir Starmer is the forensic, you know, barrister in court that forensically goes through his subject. You know, so it's two completely different styles. Like I say, the challenge will come and someday we will see the house go back to what it was. Yes. Um, I, I wouldn't put a date on that. And that will be a challenge for the leader of the opposition. But as we know, politicians are good at accommodating in the way that they work within the chamber. And it'll be good to have a chamber with PMQs in the way that we did. What we've got to do, I think it lets the atmosphere out. I think it allows the chamber to breathe and it allows politicians to get excited. Some don't go too far. It's about getting the balance right, isn't it? Getting some excitement in there. I think, I think, I think all parties miss that. I think all MPs miss that. And I think we all have the same view. It would be nice to get back to normality. What normality will look like may be slightly different than we remember. As I walk around the Houses of Parliament like you do, there are a lot of statues. There's statues of Churchill in Members' Lobby. There's Gladstone. Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher. Robert Peel. I'm mentioning all these people because these are all statues of people who others want to pull down outside of Parliament. I wonder what you thought of that and whether you might start reviewing what statues we have in the House. I'm a person who enjoys history. I think history is very important to us. It's about making judgment on history, but it's about telling the right story to history. I always believe that the story should be told and the facts should be there. And we, we've seen Bristol. I don't believe in mob rule. I don't believe nope. that people should just go around ripping down because it's something that, that is offensive. What I would say is the people of Bristol should decide. The local authorities should have decided. And what I wouldn't say, it should be melted down and made into something else, far from it. I think if the position is people don't want the monument where it is, and I quite re I understand that and, and agree with that, but it should go into a museum where the story can be told about where the wealth came from, how that wealth was accrued. And I think that's so important. It's about telling the facts of what happened. And I think that's what we've got to do now. You know, I'm appalled that... 
we have a history that can be embarrassing, which it is. We did some appalling acts, and we should stand up and say it. they were appalling. But you can't change it. You know, it has happened. Uh, okay, but so let's so, tell the truth about what happened. I, I see that. So, given given that, do you would you want to get the Speaker's Committee, the Advisory Committee on Works of Art, to review? the statues and the busts that are in Parliament. There's the Cromwell bust, which MPs turn around and face the wall because they're offended by that. There's the Peel statue. There's the Gladstone Room. There's all sorts of things. I wonder whether you wanted MPs to have a look at that and what what is on display there and whether there needs to be uh, any notes next door to it to contextualise that person for anyone who comes in to look around Parliament. Well, I would say is obviously we've always got to consistently review What's on show in the house? You're absolutely right. I was asking the other day about paintings. Did the paintings depict somebody who had been been involved in slavery? I don't know. What I do know is that people will be asking, and I think it is right that we review and we interpret what is there. Is it appropriate? Is it right? It isn't just for me to say it. It is for others to work within the committee. We have to reflect history, but we must always tell the story to that history. And I think that is the key. Are you suggesting there you want the Commission on Works of Art to review what's on display and to, and to see who is on we display? We do it all the time. What, what, what I would say is, of course, we, we, we look around. In fact, I've been having a look around myself just to see what we have got. And is, is there anything that depicts slavery? Not as I know. There may be some individuals. I'm not sure yet where we are, but we will certainly be doing it anyway. We, we do have a collection. We do have the history of, of what we've got there. We need to try and see what is on show. But it is about reinterpreting and always adding to ensure that we do reflect society as well and what society views and opinions are. Excellent. And, and in terms of, of the overhaul of the House of Parliament, I'm working from home. You're in your office. We can't meet in person because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Do you want to see the whole £4 billion r and r in quotes, overhaul of MPs' offices, close quote, scale back now so many can work from home? What I would say is I think what the country's gone through and the cost of lockdown, do I really think the government are ready to issue a cheque for, say, £15 billion? Pounds? Let's, you know, let's strike a figure. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the case. Yeah. What I would say is that r and is reflecting what else can be done. What we've got to do is protect a world heritage site. This is world-renowned building, Raybon listed star. And what I would say is that, of course, we've got to make sure that the building doesn't deteriorate. So it's about, do we need all singing, all dancing, 15 billion plus that nobody can actually see for 30 years? Or is there alternatives? And what I would say is that the R&R team are reviewing what is needed and how it has to be <laughs> done. And that's where I come. And you're, and you're rather pleased that should be happening, as you say. I'm always pleased to review. I have my view. <laughs> But in the end, it's not about my view. It is about the view and the will of the House. I am here to serve the House, (laughs) not to be a dictator to the House. You know that and I know that. I do. Now, now, when John Berker took over, he committed to staying, I think, for eight years it was. I think it was eight years. Uh, How how long will you stay as as, as Speaker? I think, think first of all, I need to get my feet under the table before I even begin to think about it. What I would say say (laughs) is there is a job to be done. I'm loving the job that I'm doing. I find it very exciting, very rewarding. And I do say it is an absolute privilege. And I think people do know when it's time to go. When that time's come, of course I'll go. (laughs) Quite. Now, Lindsay, before you go, we want to play a quick game of lockdown bingo. All right. Yes, yes. So here we are. I've got some some quick questions for you. There are no right answers, but you you have to beat Lely Moran. Let's start. Have you had a haircut from a member of your household? Yes. Have you baked a banana bread? No. Have you completed a puzzle? Yes. This is all during lockdown, don't forget. Have you done a home workout? Yes, I have indeed. Yeah, I do 20 minutes to an hour on the treadmill. Have you accidentally said something you shouldn't have said when you thought a Zoom call was muted? <laughs> no, I've been very good. No, um, Helen's just admitting she has, but I've been good. <laughs> <laughs> Helen, of course, is your chief of staff for listeners. Yes. Uh, you, have, you, have you watched Normal People? No. Have you done a virtual quiz with friends? No. Have you screamed at your Wi-Fi when it goes down? <laughs> it's usually my mobile phone because I lose reception on the train. <laughs> <laughs> Have you failed at a well-intentioned DIY task? What I would say is it's not failed, I've just not completed. 
<laughs> that's a fa- that's failure for me, Lindsay. And have you have you started have you started your own podcast yet? No, I'm too busy doing everybody else's. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay Hoyle, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, safe journey back to Chorley. Thank you for speaking to Chopper's Politics today. Thank you. Um, can I just say thanks to Chopper's Politics? Next time, face to face with a Chorley cake and a cup of tea. <laughs> You're on. Thank you. Right, stay with us. Coming up, we'll be talking leaving the EU and learning from the Lib Dem failures with Leila Moran, right after this. Go beyond the headlines with The Telegraph's coronavirus podcast. One story, one leading Telegraph journalist and 10 minutes of analysis on how the key issues affect your life. From why your children aren't back at school to the likelihood of a second wave. Search coronavirus the latest on your podcast app. Right, we're back. You're listening to Chopper's Politics. Now, it might feel like decades ago, but just six months ago to the day, it was a general election. Six months! The then Lib Dem leader, Jo Swinton, lost her seat in that election, leaving her party without a leader at all. The leadership battle to replace Jo Swinton had been postponed to May 2021 because of the pandemic, but has now been brought forward to next month after a bit of an outcry within the party. Are you keeping up back there? It's a three-way battle, between acting leader Ed Davey, MP for Bath, Weira Hophouse, and my next guest, Leila Moran. That's about a quarter of the party fighting it out to lead 12 MPs in Parliament. Leila has been the MP for Oxford West and Abingdon since 2017. So what does she hope to learn from the mistakes of Lib Dem leaders past? Has she come to terms with Brexit? And will she beat Sir Lindsay Hoyle in our game of lockdown bingo? Leila Moran, welcome to Chopper's Politics. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Good. Well, you know, still sitting in my living room, watching the world go by. And uh, and uh, but you're in Parliament, of course, aren't you? Because Parliament's back. Um, well, right now I'm in Botley in Oxfordshire. So we were down in Parliament early this week. I've just come back. And I'm delighted to report that I, I have just discovered I've successfully grown potatoes for the first time. So ah. these are the things we discover in lockdown. We're, we're going to come on to the cliches of lockdown later on in our, <laughs> in our bingo. Now, you didn't want to stand, did you, in 2019 for the leadership, but you do this time. And the Lib Dem leadership, the ballots were open in the last week of July and the result is in August. Why is that? Well, in 2017, I was elected for the first time and it's not to be sniffed out. We only had an 816 majority. I mean, that's absolutely tiny in the context of what has been and continues to be pretty volatile politics. So a lot of people very flatteringly were suggesting I should stand and pushing me to do so. But when I looked at how marginal that seat was, I just couldn't quite get myself over the line. And uh, I'm delighted to be able to say that that's what's changed. Uh, In the last election, I went from 816 to just under 9,000, which is the highest share of the vote in this constituency's history. And combined with constituents of mine on the doors during the election going, wish you were leader right now, go for it, you can do it. So I I feel in a very different place in terms of the constituency. It's been a rocky time for recent Lib Dem leaders and Joe Mm. Swinton lost her seat, of course, in 2019. But what have you learned from the recent failings, I suppose, Brexit and the rather the, the, the kind of two-tier message on Brexit the last election was a problem. Yeah, I think above all, Chris, what all politicians need to understand is that if they are seen by the electorate to be in any way hypocritical, to say one thing and do another, then that is the path to losing. The problem I always had with revoke wasn't in a sense, the policy itself. I mean, if you want to stop Brexit, that's the process by which you do it, right? So we were upfront about that. The problem was the way that that came across on doors made it look like we were anti-democratic. And of course, we're not. We are liberal Democrats and we believe in democracy. And so the framing of that was really very difficult. So you could also argue that's what coalition hurt us. You know, We said that we wouldn't raise tuition fees and then we did. When you say one thing and do another as a politician, that is the path to losing. uh, And that's what we must absolutely avoid. So it's a clean, fresh start now. We have a chance to elect a leader for the next five to 10 years. And we should be learning all those mistakes from the past. But that shouldn't stop us from being positive about the future. 
crack on. Right. So this podcast used to be called Chopper's Brexit Podcast. Can I ask you about Brexit? Are you over the issue of Brexit? And if you became in any sense in power, would you seek to rejoin the EU? I'm not over Brexit, for sure. I mean, in many ways, the reason we were campaigning to stop Brexit was because those of us on the Remain side of the argument feel very deeply it's a part of our identity to be European, and it still hurts. Um, It's also worth saying Brexit's not done for the country either. We have still a deal to strike. The first deal was a withdrawal agreement, but there's still the future deal to go. I'm really worried at the moment that the government seems to be marching towards a hard Brexit or indeed a no deal. That would be catastrophic economically at a time when the economy is already suffering greatly because of COVID-19. What I'm calling for right now is an extension so that we can avoid that economic harm. And I don't think now is the time to be ardently campaigning to rejoin. But that doesn't stop me from expressing my internationalist values. And who knows what might happen one day in the future. But right now, that's not my inclination. I I think we need to make the case for no, no deal and the closest possible relationship with our biggest trading partner. So if you became leader, you wouldn't campaign for a rejoin? At the moment, I am not inclined to put that as my top priority. I think we have to deal with coronavirus. We have to deal with the deep inequalities that we're seeing in our society, reignite equality of opportunity. There's big, big issues that we need to face. However, I will say this, four years ago today, we were still in the midst of that referendum campaign. Brexit wasn't even really a word. So I think it would be rather foolish of me to suggest what I would campaign on in four years' time. A lot could well change by then. Can the Lib Dems ever form a government under the current electoral system? Well, it's certainly very, very hard. I mean, the last election proved that. As much as you may want to have the ambition to deliver 325 seats or whatever you might want, it's very, very hard to do that in one fell swoop. So uh, one of the key planks has always been for the Liberals that we need to change our electoral system. We believe that the the first-past-the-post system leaves too many people feeling disenfranchised. What we need to focus on right now is making the positive case, the hopeful case for the Britain that we want to see. The three main pillars of my campaign are to campaign on education, equality of opportunity, equality for families, no matter their backgrounds, to achieve their potential. On the economy, we have to face the fact that COVID-19 is going to be a big hit to our economy, but there are real choices to be made about how we build back from this point. And finally, the environment, you know, the big issue that faces uh, all of us at the moment. Let's focus on these issues that, that we can all rally around uh, at the moment. And I do believe that if we put forward that positive vision for the country, people will vote Liberal Democrat in places where it makes sense to do so. And we will continue to fight the electoral system for a system that's fairer so people don't feel that their voices are less heard elsewhere. Do you want to see schools opening, uh, all schools opening in September? I mean, there's all sorts of concerns about this with the issue of the 15 strong bubbles in classes and the two metre uh, social distancing. Mm, I absolutely want to see schools reopen. I used to be a teacher. I was a maths and physics teacher before I entered Parliament. And uh, I know firsthand the disadvantage gap that can grow. The children who are left behind, some of them can't even access the services that they and their families need. It's critical that we make this happen. My worry is that the way the government has handled this without bringing all sides with them, reassuring parents. I did a parent survey where I was asking, how do you feel about this wider reopening? Many did not feel assured about the safety for not just their children, but for the teachers and also for them. I think the Department for Education and Gavin Williamson should have done more to reach out wider. And actually, what I would like the government to consider now, and I'm calling for this today, is to take inspiration from what's happened in Wales. They are, in fact, calling for a wider reopening at the end of this month. And they're doing it by having a rotation system where they can at least get everyone in so they can check up on the children and have all the teachers meet again so that they can come up with what to do in September. So I think there are ways of delivering this. I would like to see all political parties work together to do this. You're worried, aren't you, about banks leaving, leaving villages, aren't you, in, particularly in rural areas? I'm very worried about rural areas in general. Even in the schools debate, they seem to be forgotten. Any school that's under you know, 150 pupils, for example, seems to be very badly served by the government. And small villages where the last bus stopped working yeah. a couple of years ago and the last bank. And, and I think that we owe it to those communities 
to be able to have a, a way to safeguard those very basic services. Otherwise, we're going to have a two-track Britain, and that's not good enough. What I would like to see is legislation brought in where essentially local authorities get given a veto that would block the branch closure for 12 months. And that would then allow a negotiation to have another bank come in if they are able to. And that would mean that we wouldn't have vulnerable and elderly people left in a position, especially with the death of public transport, who then aren't able to access their money. We have to have a country that works for everybody. I've got to ask about your character because you are standing for leader. You were arrested once for slapping your boyfriend. I, I read here... For in, in previous previous articles about you. Can you explain what happened there? Well, as you can imagine, this is a, a deeply personal issue. At the time, I said it, and I'll say it again, it was a defensive move. It was done in self-defense. It was a very difficult uh, time for both of us, and I felt very scared. I will point out, however, that all charges were dropped. It never went any further, and I am very grateful for the laws that exist that point to zero tolerance on domestic violence as someone who has experienced that. I feel very passionately that that's the right way to go. And I'm delighted that the Houses of Parliament are now pushing forward a a bill that covers these issues. Thank you, Leila. And uh, do you feel confident trying to run a party whose forebear was Gladstone, whose family made money from slavery? I do, because, I mean, it's worth saying Gladstone's father was the slave owner. And I am absolutely appalled by the fact that I didn't know this. At the time, those slave owners were recompensed to the tune of somewhere between 17 and 20 billion pounds in today's money. That was 40% of the national budget at the time was used to pay them off. And I don't know if your listeners knew this, but in 2015, we were still paying that off. I think that's extraordinary. Gladstone himself, not his father, led a party that I'm very, very proud of. They were liberal, they were progressives, the first major politician to back Irish home rule. And so I think in terms of our own party, we have much that he did to be proud of, but certainly not proud of his father. The bigger debate is actually around facing our colonial history and our past. And actually, it's a really important time for us to look and listen to what those communities are saying. The fact that perhaps what I've just said is news to many people listening just goes to show we need better education and we need to look again at our history syllabus. Are we really sure we understand our own history as a country, where our wealth came from, and then understand the feelings of those communities who feel so hurt that we continue to celebrate these people? Of course. You, you've explained you explained the issue with Gladstone and his family. Do you think we should be renaming rooms in Parliament and, and expunging Gladstone's name, remove his statue from inside Parliament? I do not. I do not. I think Gladstone himself was uh, an extraordinary politician, extraordinary leader of the Liberals, and actually the, his place is proud in our history. However, I do stand by people, for example, in my town in Oxford, who do want to remove the statues of people like Cecil Rhodes. There is no parallel to be drawn between the two. Cecil Rhodes was a white supremacist. We should not be celebrating that. It's counter to modern British values. But, you know, Gladstone, on the other hand, I don't believe that we should be blaming children for the wrongs of their fathers. Len Rand, thank you. And on this this week's edition of Chopper's Politics, we are playing a game of lockdown bingo. Now, Earlier, I asked these questions of the Speaker of the House of Commons, Lindsay Hoyle. Would you be willing to play along and answer the same questions? I'll let you know how many you get. I am always willing to play along in a quiz. (laughs) Okay. Here we go. Lennon Moran, have you ever, during lockdown, okay, had a haircut from a member of your household? No. Baked a banana bread? Yes, but I would do that outside of lockdown too. Ah. I'm rather good at it. (laughs) Fair enough. Completed a puzzle? Nope. No, not in all those three months. No, I'm not very good. I've <laughs> done a home workout. Oh, yes. And in oh, fact, yes. I've taken up yoga for the first time in my life. And it's a wonderful thing. Have you accidentally said something which you shouldn't have done in a Zoom call you thought was mooted? No, I have not. No. Have you watched normal people? I have not. And uh, I want to, though. So it's on the list. Yes, nor have I. Have you done a virtual quiz? I have indeed. With friends? I I have, not just with friends, it was about friends. (laughs) Have you screamed at your Wi-Fi as it goes down midway through a key conversation? I absolutely have, yes. Have you failed at a well-intentioned DIY task? 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sewing. My own mask did not work out very well. <laughs> oh, dear. And have you started a podcast? I have not. I have not. Although I'm very admiring of others who have. Well, three cheers for that. Thank you so much. You have tied with speaker Lindsay O'Hoyle. How do you feel? That's wonderful. I think that's the ideal outcome. I wouldn't have wanted either of us to win or lose against each other. I admire him greatly. <laughs> on that note, Leila Moran, best of luck in the leadership election. And thank you for coming on Jobs Politics. Do come on again. Thank you very much for having me. Well, that's it for this week. How did he do in the bingo? Let us know. You can get in touch with us at chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or tweet us at chopperspodcast. I got four out of ten worse than Sir Lindsay Hoyle and Leila Moran. I'm clearly not a lockdown cliche. Thank you to my guest this week, Sir Lindsay Hoyle and, of course, Leila Moran. Thank you to my podcast producers, Elliot Lampett, Louisa Wells and Theo Leludis. But most importantly of all, thank you to you for taking time to listen to this podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please do leave us a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. TJNTC did that this week. They said, in quotes, essential, balanced and informative listening. Bravo! And better wishes to Mrs Chopper. Thanks. Reviews like that really help listeners find us. And Mrs Chopper is delighted. Ooh, did I get a mention again? How exciting. Don't forget, if you work the NHS, you can get a free six-month digital subscription to The Telegraph as our small way of saying thank you for everything over the past few months. Details of that offer are in the show notes. And everyone else can get 30 days free access to The Telegraph's content by going to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper. And always, always buy a copy of The Dead Telegraph if you can, and it's safe to do so. You will never regret it. Until next time, cheerio!